Uh, and this is obviously the, the churchyard. We're not quite at the right time of the year, and uh, our grass cutters are, as you can see, super efficient. But we get some wonderful small, lots of small fungi on the churchyard up here, um, just growing in the grass. And I forget the name of them, but they are they are quite yes, yes, white wax caps. Yeah, wax cap fungi. Yeah. Just little ones. Yeah and different colours, orange and, and purple ones and white ones. A number of and these are now thought to be internationally important. So yes. A church I'd like this, uh, sort of jokingly claim, has this equivalent of a blue whale, a giant panda, a snow leopard, and uh, possibly a Bengal tiger, all in the same. Yeah, yeah. absolutely so wonderful. Internationally important, but they, they love this very short turf. Yes, yeah. Which we... A lot of conservationists hate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you kind of win, can you, really? Yeah. <laughs> doomed either way. We're doomed, doomed if we do, way. doomed if we don't. Anyway, um, I'm keeping an eye on the time because we don't want to be here half the night as well. Um, this is the, the old, we think the older of the two trees, um, certainly probably 800 years, which means that it was here when the monks from Whitland arrived to found a new abbey here in 11, 70, about 1170, 1176. So it's from a religious point of view that yew trees are significant. I blame school history for a lot of misconceptions about history. We always learned at school, at least when I was at school, which seemed back in the Stone Age sometime, that um, the yew trees were in the churchyard so as people could make bows and arrows with them, particularly the arrows. Would have to make a hell of a long time to make some arrows because they grow very, very slowly, as we know. The significance of the yew tree is more likely to come from a hermit who took up residence here, perhaps in sort of mid medieval times, somewhere around in the late 1000s, 1100. There could well have been a hermit, sometimes called an anchorite, who lived here in a rudimentary shelter or little cave or what have a hollowed out cave and just practiced his religious pra um, um, feelings in a very very remote area and they planted trees of this sort yew trees because they had a religious significance and that religious significance like other aspects of Christianity goes right back to, to pagan times and where did the, the anchorite come from? Where, where is he likely to have come from? It's quite possible that he came all the way from St. Harmon, which is about six miles away, because uh, St. Harmon was a very important center of um, Christianity in early times. If you've been to St. Harmon, you will know that the churchyard is almost perfectly curvilinear. And the church sits on a little rays in the, within that churchyard. And if you walk around, look around at the inside of the wall, you can see the remains of the old clan, the enclosure. That's what the clan is. It's, sometimes people think clan means church, it doesn't mean enclosure. And you can see some of the old enclosure earthworks inside the wall of St. Harmon. So we know it was a very early site. And the early Christians, and we're looking around 700 AD, built on the site of an already existing religious significant place. So we think that there was a religious practice at St. Harmon before the arrival of Christianity. So we were looking at Christianity over the best part of 1500 years and a significant site before that. And as I was saying when we started, there was always somebody in the landscape before you. And so we traced back. And St. Harmon was what is known as a class church. And that means that there were a number of priests, monks, and lesser orders who operated from that church site and then went out into the surrounding area, ministering to people, making contact, spreading the, spreading the word. So it's possible that the anchorite, a hermit, came from St. Harmon down here and lived a very isolated existence. But when the Cistercians arrived in the 12th century, they were looking for a site that already had religious significance. 
And so that could be a possibility. We can't prove it, there's no documentary evidence, but that, that is a way in which it works. And there are only three class churches in Radnorton, uh, Glazebury and, you can pick it up in the name, and Glascombe. So if you go through Glazebury near Hay or walking around in the lovely hills around Glascombe, you're, you're on the site of a, a class church. And the, one of the townships of St. Harmon, that's the areas to, into which the parish is divided, is called Clasgarmon uh, still, and as appears in, in the tithe survey in the 1840s, it occurs in, in the um, census returns in Victorian times as well, so the names persist. So that is a possibility that there was religious significance before the abbey and before there was a church on this site. This is the second church on the site here. This one was built by the Phillips family in their munificence in the 1860s, 1866. The previous church probably sat on this flatter ledge that you can see just below here. And uh, inside I've got a photograph of a painting that was done by a lady called Mary Layton uh, about 1850. So Mary Layton and her brother, uh, who was a vicar, who were friends of the Phillips, who were very keen on promulgating the church. And uh, her brother had been invited to take a service here and Mary sat outside painting the church while he was inside taking the service. Now either she'd heard all his sermons before or they were so damn awful she stayed outside. But anyway, she, she over time produced a lovely collection of paintings, um, watercolours uh, of churches where she was outside painting and he was inside taking the service. So there we are. The church itself is um, a good example of its sort. It was uh, designed by somebody called John Wilkes Poundley, and Poundley was an architect who lived at Blackhall Kerry up into Montgomeryshire. He also practised in Liverpool as well, I suspect, but by and large he made more money out of his Liverpool practice than he did out of his Kerry one. But he designed the, the church here, and he was also responsible for the enlargement of the hall next door, which we shall come across a little bit later on. The church is modelled on a church in Brittany where they have these towers and several of Poundley's churches have that sort of tower. So, um, the plan and appearance at a glance of Sarn Church, which is not far from Kerry, looks very much like this one, same sort of tower, but uh, less elaborate. I think they must have done a cut price version for, for Sarn. Um, obviously to build that at the time was, was quite expensive. And over the door you see a tympanum which uh, is a copy and it's based on a, um, a view of the ascension and there is a um, late medieval uh, tympanum that survived somehow or the other with the church ruins which is now in the wall of the, um, the garden down there. Um, quite whether the Cistercians actually had the Tapanum or whether it was brought here at a later date because they didn't usually bother with that sort of thing. But that, that one is obviously Victorian uh, when the church was built in 1866 and some elaborate pillars as well. So I'll take you inside, just give you a brief outline of it. Uh, the great glory of the church is the stained glass, which uh, you're not going to get the best effect from today because it's cloudy. We had all these lovely days when, when the sun was shining and this, the glass absolutely glowed. But I'll talk to you a little bit about the interior before we sort of move on of Mary Layton's painting, which is, shows what the church looked like before. If you have ever been to Reelton Church down near Aberedu, it would be very much like that. Well, I'll leave that photograph there and you can have a look at it. Right, so this is the Victorian's take on the church. The little church that was here, they said was falling to bits and so they needed to replace the whole thing. But in fact, the previous squire, who was called Thomas Wilson, left written records that the church as he found it when he came needed attention and it was his priority to get the original church sorted out. So he put a new ceiling in, he supplied an organ for it. 
he gave that painting up there, which is a copy of an old master. Um, and um, the place was tickety-boo, but it didn't suit the Phillips, particularly in the 1860s. I mentioned Anna Theophila Phillips, the lady who got the school moved. Um, her father was vicar at Stockport for 47 years. So there was sort of built-in churching within the family. And the Church of England, because everything was, the Church of Wales didn't exist before the 1920s, it was all part of, the Anglican Church was all part of the Church of England, um, was going through a sort of upheaval in the 1860s. You might have heard of something called the Tractarian Movement or the, the Oxford Movement, had various names. Um, but it was an, an attempt to revive churches as they would have been in pre-Reformation times. So they wanted to put the clock back several hundred years and have a different form of service, much more like, as we would understand it, the Roman Catholic liturgy and the building that goes with it. So whilst from a casual observer's point of view, this is a church, a complete thing. It is actually comes in different sorts of stages. Uh, you tend to find always with the church of mid-Victorian times and the Anglo-Catholic revival, as it was called, the font will be very near the door, either right by the door, like this one is, or just opposite, as, as it is in, in Rerda Church, if you, if you pop in there. And that was a sign of welcome to the new Christian. The baptism in the church was important. So that's what you'll find. Um, the nave of the church is comparatively plain. The tiles on the floor are plain quarry tiles. Nothing unusual about that. Um, in this church, you do have the benefit of a not quite so cold floor under the seat. <laughs> so you have a bit of a wooden floor there. But then as you go further eastwards to the other end of the church, so the decoration becomes more elaborate. And again, this is part of the idea of the, of, of the Catholic churches, um, the Orthodox churches, where the, the, the focal point of the church is the sanctuary in the chancel at the far end. So you will see when you get to the chancel arch, which is very much an import into Welsh church architecture, early Welsh Christian churches tend not to have a chancel. They don't have a big arch at that point there. The church ends there. So you can see around the, the chancel arch, there's some quite elaborate carving. It's what's called stiff leaf carving and actually picks up on what we think they would know the Abbey Church contained before it was destroyed at the dissolution, that sort of carving. So it's getting a little bit more opulent. You see there's some polished marble in, built into it as well. And then when you get down there, you can see the diamond tiles in the steps and the floor is a little bit better than this, quite a little bit better than this. And it's up a level. And then you go on towards the altar rail where there are more steps. So it goes up another level and the tiles there are more opulent. And you can see around the back of the altar table, quite elaborate and good quality tiling on the wall of the church. So that important focal area of the church is more, more opulent, better decorated, uh, more sacred than these areas out here. If you go into a lot of early churches, so some of you might have been into Flanano Church, for example, you've got a, which isn't an early church itself, but it has a wonderful screen in, in it. And uh, Abaredo Church has screens. A lot, a lot of our local churches have these. Old Radnor, I think, has a good one as well from memory. And the idea was that the, the priests perform their duties really out of sight of the congregation. And that preserved the mystique of the ceremony. 
Um, and in some churches you'll see little squints built into the wall, so you could look through to the altar. But, and certainly before the Reformation, the priests did everything away from the eyes of the congregation. Uh, that was again part of the ceremony. And, and the Victorians were rather inclined to go back to that sort of almost exclusivity in worship and conduct of services. That's not what we're used to today. Um, over the arch there you have the, uh, a rood, which is the, the crucifixion, obviously, with John, the disciple who Jesus loved on one side, Mary on the other side. Um, and that would have, that's really just a, a hint of, of the earlier medieval type of screening, which were very, very elaborately carved pieces of work. Uh, the stained glass as I said, was really the, the glory of this church in my view. Uh, the, the apsidal windows at that end, the east end, are by a, a glassmaker, London glassmaker called Heaton Butler and Bain, who were the foremost glass manufacturers of Victorian England, including royal warrant for Queen Victoria herself. They were said to have produced something like 86,000 church windows between about 1840 and the, first, the outbreak of the First World War. So there, it is really very high quality glass. That's just about the best, best fittings that you could get in a church. And uh, do go up and have a look at this when, when I've stopped. And the, the west window here is a rose window very obvious. Um, not many rose windows like that in Radnorshire. And in the centre, you've got the, uh, the four um, gospel writers and then the 12 disciples round that and Mary in, in the centre. This window is a little bit later than these and it was um, uh, built to the memory of one of the Phillips uh, family again, um, mid-Victorian times. So that, that is for me a church today. So do you have a few few minutes to, to go and look at particularly that end and the windows, the, the one on the, 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 the half, half right there, a, re, um, a representation of the very famous Holman Hunt, Light of the World um, painting. So there, there, it, it is significant glass. <laughs> I hope you don't see the bit where it's dropped out. <laughs> the veneration to the east is quite interesting as well. That's a hangover from pagan religion.